hundred years, MI5 has been a secret service. Working in the shadows, its officers and agents kept Britain safe. Now the world is at war with global terrorism and we are all on the front line. MI5 stands between us and horrors like 7-7. But rumor and intrigue surround its secret operations. So now, for the first time, MI5 has opened its files and we can discover more about the allegations that they plotted against the prime minister or that a famous trade union leader was a KGB agent and why three terrorists were shot dead in Gibraltar. secretary stuck her head round the door and said, I think it's something you need to see on the television. Sir Stephen Lander was head of MI5 when 9-11 changed the world. He has never spoken on television about the atrocity, nor his role as one of those leading the counter-attack against global terrorism. As we were standing looking at the smoking tower, it was pretty obvious to us that this was Al-Qaeda. And that's what I said to the Prime Minister at four o'clock. But I thought it was UBL. UBL was Osama bin Laden. Suddenly, under the blue skies of New York, terror had a human face. And Sir Stephen and MI5 knew who he was. They had been watching Al-Qaeda since the mid-1990s. We knew the world had changed because of the suicide bomber. It was the beginning of a new world, really. The intelligence community and politicians on both sides of the Atlantic reacted swiftly. America went into lockdown. All transatlantic flights were canceled, bar one. Within 24 hours, a C-130 Hercules secretly took off from RAF Bryce Norton, bound for Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. The three security agencies of the British government were sending their officers. Eliza, my successor, went with the chief of SIS and the director of GCHQ. And they flew from the UK to the US. The Americans had to be nervous letting any aircraft into their airspace, even with F-16s escorting it. I think the only airplane to land in the US for 48 hours was a very important signal for the American community and the American government about UK support. The team went straight to CIA headquarters in Langley. In London, Sir Stephen attended a series of meetings at number 10. The agenda? How secure was Britain after 9-11? There was the Prime Minister, John Scarlett, who's the chairman of the JIC, and there was me, sitting on the sofas, and we talked about who'd done it, what it meant. Would the UK be a target? Yes, probably. We talked about the training camps in Afghanistan and how they were sort of part of this conspiracy. That's where the planning had probably been done and our concerns about you know, who was at the camps and when they might come back and trying to get your head around, what would this mean for us? Were we going to do a whole lot of scenario planning over nuclear bombs on Westminster Bridge and all that sort of thinking? Since 9-11, MI5 has uncovered more than a dozen plots to murder thousands of innocent Britons. But it's not the successes we always hear about. Failures are horribly and spectacularly public. The nature of terrorism is such that when things go wrong, it's jolly visible because the bomb goes off or people are killed or some atrocity. Within the last decade, MI5 has changed focus and doubled in size. After 9-11, it had to. 
Today, it has a budget running into hundreds of millions of pounds and employs nearly 3,800 people. None are identified, except the Director General. It needs to be a secret service to do its job. All the intelligence they gather is stored in the registry, deep in the basement of Thames House, MI5's headquarters. For almost 100 years, it has been strictly off limits to outsiders. Until now. One man, Professor Christopher Andrew, has been given unprecedented access to MI5 files to write its authorized history. But Andrew was an academic, not a spy. It was proposed that I should join MI5 while I was writing the history. I would never have proposed it, but it seemed to me to make quite an amount of sense. If you go in to write a history warts and all, People are going to talk to you more frankly if you're not an outside contractor who is perceived as fault-finding. It was a fine balance that he had to achieve. He read thousands of files over six years. The difficulty was to reveal the truth but protect identities and necessary secrets. I did not have, and I should not have had, the last word on what could be released and what could not. But every single judgment that I arrived at, whether it was comfortable or not for MI5, is there. Sir Stephen Lander was the director general with the controversial idea of publishing MI5's history. There's been an awful lot of nonsense written about MI5 over the years. Some of that's helpful. A little bit of myths never does you any harm if you're in that sort of business. But uh, we also got a lot of criticism, which was unjust. It just wasn't real. So all those myths that we've been putting up with, you know, the Wilson plot or whether we'd inve investigated Mickey Mouse or John Lennon or something, all that stuff was a nuisance to us and sort of held us down. For the first time, the real spooks can tell their own stories from the world of spies that we only know from fiction. Spies on film and TV are stone-faced, close-lipped, glamorous. They save the world once an hour. The reality isn't quite the same. Television portrays operations of being half a dozen people with guns or something running about. You can't do surveillance without lots of people, uh, without teams working together. So the cult of the individual television portrays is inaccurate. Big investigations involve lots of police forces and other people as well. And therefore, you're, the idea that the whole thing is down to sort of the boss and six people is rubbish. MI5's files reveal that one of the most potentially dangerous terrorist conspiracies happened in 2006. The most important counter-terrorist operation in the whole of British history, sounds exaggerated, but it was not was Operation Overt. And Operation Overt uh, discovered and nipped in the bud of what would have been, I think, uh, an Al-Qaeda success in its own terms on the scale of 9-11. The bombers planned to blow up seven transatlantic jets and murder thousands of passengers in a coordinated attack to surpass 9-11. The plan was to use the flash units and disposable cameras to detonate liquid explosives in soft drink bottles. Plot leader, Abdullah Ahmed Ali, was a British-born Muslim who'd attended terrorist training camps in Pakistan with the leaders of the 7-7 London bombings. MI5's files show how spoiling the plot stretched resources to the limit. What we're talking about is tens of thousands of men and women hours. What is achieved is video footage of them actually constructing the bombs martyrdom statements that were obtained from the surveillance and were again introduced in evidence at the trial. If you work out how much work was involved, I don't think that any counter-terrorist operation in British history has ever been as labor-intensive as that was. When MI5 began in earnest, just before the First World War, Vernon Kell, its first director general, had a staff of 16, including the caretaker. 
Even so, its success rate was surprisingly high. It was still a small organization when World War II broke out in 1939. But the German threat was bigger this time. The result was a chaotic and ill-planned expansion. Friends of friends and those with the right connections were hastily hired. For quite a long period, people who joined Five joined because they knew somebody in it and they were recommended. So there was a sort of, there were personal relationships built up sort of before you became a member of the organization. Lady Cynthia Poston, daughter of the Duke of Albemarle, had been presented to King Edward VIII in 1936. Lord Chamberlain, the Earl of Cromer, and walked past before the Duke and Duchess of York and the Duke and Duchess of Kent. Oh, well, they were what is described now as, as upper class. Uh, they, they all came from the top levels of society. Oh, my stepmother knew Sir Vernon Kell, and I went up for an interview at the War Office and was interviewed by Miss Dunstaville. She was an elderly lady, uh, unmarried, presumably, and the next day she gave me an assignation to go to Wormwood Scrubs. It was here that MI5 began planning Operation Double Cross. Double Cross was the most successful deception in the entire history of warfare. All German spies who were landed in Britain, with the exception of one poor man who lands in Cambridge and commits suicide, are all captured, every single one of them. After capturing them, they turned most of them, creating double agents who fed misleading information back to their German spy masters. It mattered enormously because Hitler bothered a lot about the reports that came from his agents in England, all of whom he believed to be genuine Bidouin German spies, all of whom, in fact, were MI5 agents. And he based a lot of his plans on information that came from these spies, which was quite untrue. MI5 were amazed by the incompetence of many German agents. They used rather odd and not, in Five's opinion, very high-class agents. They sent over a lot of thugs, one highly distinguished burglar who changed sides just as well, and Five was surprised they didn't use higher-class agents. They were all sent by the Abwehr, the Armed Forces Intelligence Staff, rather than by the SS Intelligence Staff, which was a much more formidable and much more able body of men this was probably on the Germans' part a mistake, but from which Five benefited. MI5's most successful double-cross agent was a Spanish businessman, Juan Pujol, codenamed Garbo after the film star. Garbo helped fool the Germans into believing the D-Day plan was to land in Pas de Calais, not Normandy. After the war, Garbo received an MBE from the Queen he'd already been awarded the Iron Cross by Hitler. When Garbo gets the news that he has been awarded the Iron Cross, he radios back to his German intelligence controller, at this moment, I am so overcome by emotion that I cannot put my feelings into words. Why not? He was rolling around on the floor, helpless with laughter, and so was his MI5 case officer. Double Cross shows the extraordinary British talent for really superior practical jokes. But the outcome was nearly not so comical. MI5 files show that tragedy was narrowly averted. For the first time, it can be revealed that two German agents did penetrate MI5. MI5 was penetrated by two people who had a previous record of working as Abwehr agents. One was a man called Volkert van Krutrich and somebody called Jack Hooper. The two agents had been working for MI6 in Holland. Their cover story was that they were fleeing the German invasion. MI5 bought it and employed them. 
Luckily, they did not advance high enough in MI5 to jeopardize Double Cross. Only after the war ended did the pair's true allegiance come to light. When Wormwood Scrubs was bombed in 1940, MI5 moved to the more salubrious surroundings of Blenheim Palace. There, Lady Cynthia met art historian, MI5 officer, and Soviet spy, Anthony Blunt. He was a friend of my brother-in-law's, and he'd been at Trinity, and I used to meet him and go out with him to lunch. He went round the secretaries behaving like Christopher Robin, taking his cod liver oil and saying things like, that's what Tigger's like. And it may sound like a pretty feeble joke now, but at the time it was considered witty. It was quite incredible that Blunt was ever accepted into MI5, given his known communist connections. MI5 already had on record that he had been to Russia. He had expressed to a number of people his support for what was going on there. And he'd actually been expelled from a military intelligence training course. But here's the problem. Only a year before the outbreak of war, uh, MI5 only had 30 officers. It had to expand extraordinarily rapidly. There wasn't a proper vetting procedure in place. Blunt said his communist interests were linked to his art history studies. He was believed and lucky too. When Churchill demanded monthly bulletins of MI5 activities, guess who got the job? One of the most extraordinary things about Anthony Blunt's wartime career in MI5 is that he's reporting to both Winston Churchill and to Joseph Stalin. Blunt passed on so many documents, more than 1,700 in four years, that his Soviet masters thought him a double agent. They only changed their minds when, 10 days before D-Day, Blunt handed over the complete landing and deception plans. It's all very well to argue that Britain and the Soviet Union were on the same side. And therefore, providing uh, British intelligence to the Russians is merely providing intelligence to an ally. It is not as simple as that for a number of reasons. And one of them is passing on the secret that we had broken the German codes. When the Allies captured a German Enigma machine, they broke its secret code at Bletchley Park. It was one of the most closely guarded secrets of the war. But Blunt told his Soviet masters about the breakthrough. We do know that the Germans were able to read some Russian ciphers. Now, if in the military instructions that got to Russian troops on the Eastern Front, there had been any reference to material which could only have been learnt from breaking German ciphers, then the Germans might have changed those ciphers, and that was an appalling risk. And that was a risk that was taken by Anthony Blunt. It wouldn't have enabled Hitler to win the war, but it would have meant that he would have lost it a good deal more slowly. After the war, Blunt went back to being an art historian and later, surveyor of the Queen's pictures. He wasn't publicly exposed as a Soviet spy until 1979. I acted according to my conscience in during this in 19, whenever it was, 35, 36. Uh, and that meant disloyalty to this country. But uh, as I've said, it was, I believed it was the right thing in the cause of anti-fascism. I now realize bitterly uh, that this was totally wrong. But Blunt wasn't working alone. He was part of a network of spies recruited at Cambridge who infiltrated British intelligence. Guy Burgess, Donald MacLean, John Cancross and Kim Philby, along with Blunt, were known to the KGB as the Magnificent Five. Their tale of treachery is the stuff of spy novels. But what nearly brought the service to its knees was the suggestion of a sixth spy. Sir Roger Hollis, later Director General of MI5. If he had been a traitor, it would have been the most devastating blow of all. One of the most destructive things that can happen in any organization is to have a conspiracy theorist who becomes obsessed by the hunt for imaginary traitors. That is what Peter Wright does. Peter Wright 
was the self-appointed Witchfinder General within MI5. He became convinced there was a Soviet mole in the highest ranks of MI5. His belief became an obsession. When I first joined, I was sent off to see this man. He said I was far too young to be involved in these things, and would I please clear off? So I instantly took a dislike to him. Uh, he was known as being an oddball. He was one of those people who think they're the only people who understand something, and everybody else should mind their own business. So he was always stopping other people doing things as he knew best. We used to call him the KGB resident, because he was doing more to help the KGB than anybody else, because he stopped us sort of doing our job. When Wright retired to Tasmania, his vendetta continued. He went public and fed his stories to a journalist. Right away, you could see he was a very devious character, but then all people in MI5 are. That, you've got to be. It's devious work you're doing. And anyone who said, oh, I can't tell a lie, I mean, he's no good in MI5, is he? Later, Chapman Pincher helped Wright to find a publisher for Spycatcher. It became an international bestseller, selling more than two million copies. The British government's attempts to stop its publication became a national embarrassment. <laughs> I don't feel a bit sympathetic with him. I mean, Peter Wright was a traitor in their midst, a different kind of traitor, but he was one. The fact that he did it for money rather than anything else is horrific for them. He caused havoc externally by publishing the book. Internally, the day you retire, you cease to have any currency. His sort of long-term impact was not visible. It was just he was a pain in the ass to deal with when I met him. <laughs> but what do the MI5 files say about Sir Roger Hollis? Is there any evidence to show he was a traitor? The Hollis story was always a really stupid story. Why? Because all the way during the Second World War, Roger Hollis is saying, look, we can't afford to stop paying attention to the Soviet target. We can't afford to stop meticulously recording the identities of all members of the British communists that we come across. This went far beyond the needs of cover. So actually, he's somebody who begins to fight the Cold War even before uh, the Cold War. In the KGB headquarters in Moscow, they were confounded by the publicity surrounding Wright and Hollis. British intelligence knew this because their agent told them. I remember sitting in the office of the head of the British section of the KGB, and he was reading a British newspaper, uh, accessible, uh, available for him only, because it was never sold in, in the streets. And he was reading, why is they speaking about Roger Hollis? Such nonsense. Can't understand it. It must be some special English trick um, directed against us. Hidden in the thousands of MI5 files are the names of other Britons who did spy for the KGB, some at the heart of the British establishment. The idea that a future British prime minister could have been a Russian spy is almost unthinkable. But some in Moscow and London thought the unthinkable. Harold Wilson was a frequent visitor to Moscow as a junior politician and businessman. The Russians had extraordinary and very foolish hopes for Wilson. But in the mid-1950s, the KGB opens what it called an agent operational file on Harold Wilson. And he is given a code name. The code name is Olding. Uh, they actually hoped to recruit him. It could be said that Wilson brought suspicion on himself with his choice of friends. Probably his closest friend in the business world was a man called Joseph Kagan, who manufactured the Ganex Max, which Wilson wore regularly, and who became, thanks to Harold, Sir Joseph Kagan, and later, Lord Kagan. Now, between 1964 and 1971, Lord Kagan met a KGB officer every week who would come around to his flat, ask him for the latest gossip. Now, it's not likely that state secrets were passed over, but this is a highly inappropriate friendship for a prime minister. Friendships like this brought Wilson to the attention of MI5. Wilson's extravagant praise of Soviet leader Khrushchev made things worse. 
Later, Wilson became suspicious of MI5's interest in him and thought they were leaking stories to the newspapers. He thought that MI5 was feeding with this information. And he also felt that in the process, MI5 was spying on him. And they bugged his rooms in number 10 Downing Street. To add to Wilson's suspicions, America's secret service were caught up in the atmosphere of distrust. There was a problem with the CIA, and that is there was a man there called Angleton who was more prone to suspect people even than Peter Wright was. And he had an operation there, codenamed Oat Chief, in which they were looking at the possibility that the British Prime Minister was a Soviet agent. And Angleton became friendly with Wright, and so the two stoked each other up. On being re-elected in 1974, Wilson declared to a colleague, there are only three people listening, you, me, and MI5. He believed that behind the picture of one of his most illustrious predecessors, Mr. Gladstone, there was some kind of tiny camera which was observing him. He had always been a conspiracy theorist, and he now begins to believe that the security service is plotting against him. He reaches the stage that when he's going into the gents in number 10, who put his finger to his lips, he would point to the light fitting in the ceiling, he would turn on the taps in order to indicate um, that uh, it was probably bugged. This is the sad decline of one of the ablest prime ministers there had ever been in Britain. Harold Wilson died in 1995 after suffering dementia. Only now has Chris Andrew discovered in the MI5 files that perhaps Wilson's suspicions had some substance. He found a file on one Norman John Worthington. MI5 never told Harold Wilson that it had a file on him. It was given the pseudonym of Worthington. And yet MI5 never investigated Harold Wilson as such. What the file contained was material about Harold Wilson's contacts related to the fact that, as we know from KGB archives, the KGB did attempt to recruit him as an agent. Never had the slightest uh, uh, success in doing so. Wilson was innocent, but other Labour colleagues weren't. John Stonehouse, a junior minister, is best known for faking his own drowning, leaving his clothes on a Miami beach and running away to Australia with his mistress. The MI5 files reveal that for more than 10 years, Stonehouse was a Czech agent. He was questioned after a defector named him, but never prosecuted for lack of admissible evidence. But MI5's files have revealed a more serious case of potential treachery, this time by a major trade union figure. Former KGB officer Alek Gordievsky, who secretly worked for British intelligence, found his case file. In the British section of the KGB, I looked through the files of the so-called agents. Some agents were very weak doing very little for the KGB. But still, it was a kind of asset. And we were supposed to run them as agents as much as possible. And there was a file of Jack Jones. Jack Jones was a veteran of the International Brigade in the Spanish Civil War. He went on to become leader of the Transport and General Workers Union. Hugely popular and widely respected, he died in spring 2009, aged 96 having become a much-loved champion of old-age pensioners in his retirement. The allegations that Jack Jones was a KGB agent shocked his surviving family. His youngest son, Michael, is currently clearing his father's South London flat. The cry, and it's been made recently, every man for himself. Representatives of work people I want to see. This and meeting is here. to demonstrate the trade union unity with the Mr. Andrew must have realized that when you reveal what's in MI5 files like this, with no real proof, that 
the nastiest sections of the gutter press in this country are bound to seize on uh, these kind of canards and blow them up. In, and, you know, it's very distressing. Obviously not just for me, but for many members of the family and, and very good friends of Jack, of which he had very many, of course, in this country, because, you know, he really did work all his life to try to improve the conditions for ordinary working people. The book says that from 1964 to 1968, the KGB regarded Jack Jones as an agent. KGB judgment, not MI5 judgment. Why did the KGB reach that conclusion? Because during that period of four years, Jack Jones was willing to provide confidential but not secret and certainly not classified Labour Party and trade union material to a contact in the Soviet embassy. Uh, for which the KGB was ever so grateful. When Czechoslovakia's Prague Spring of 1968 was crushed by Soviet tanks, a disillusioned Jones turned his back on the KGB. In 1982, Alek Gordievsky was posted to London. There was a telegram. Please resume the contacts with our old agent, Jack Jones. So very unwillingly, I visited him in his flat and invited him to a restaurant. And then I asked the head of station, should I give him money? And he, knowing a little bit of Jack Jones's background, said, yes, give him some cash. What is claimed is that Gordievsky slipped him 250 pounds. <laughs> it's ridiculous why my father would never take money for anything like that. I mean, he twice turned down the offer of being in a House of Lords. He was offered endless directorships of companies. He could have feathered his nest over and over. We could have been living in a mansion house. I showed him the list of the three union leaders and asked him to describe each of them, who of them can be recruitable for the KGB. And he wrote on this list who was recruitable for the KGB. He was absolutely proper and very, very valuable agent for the KGB, distinguished agent of the KGB. He was very respected by the KGB and very, um, um, uh, very much um, loved by the department because he was a dream of the KGB, so brilliant and so useful and so well-disciplined. These are just reports from a notorious double agent. I don't know why I should believe anything he says, really. I mean, he was obviously a professional liar. Gordievsky may yet drop another bombshell. He claims that there is at least one other important political figure from that era whose Soviet contacts are suspicious. The security service has got reasons to keep some names still secret. So Prince of Andrew's book is 1,000 pages, but it's not the whole truth. It is probably only three quarters of the truth. Until the late 1960s, MI5's resources had been devoted to counter-espionage defending the nation from spies at home, abroad, even within. But then, a new threat emerged. The provisional IRA began a campaign of shootings and bombings across the United Kingdom, repeatedly striking at the heart of the British establishment. The lead intelligence role in Britain was run not by the service, but by the Metropolitan Police. But MI5 did have the lead role in Gibraltar. So the biggest ever deployment till that point of MI5 against the IRA takes place not in the United Kingdom, but in Gibraltar. In February 1988, an MI5 surveillance team was working with Spanish police on Operation Flavius. The events which followed became an international controversy. The flames were fanned by a TV documentary, Death on the Rock. MI5 was caught up in allegations of a shoot-to-kill policy. The files show that Siobhan O'Hanlon, a known provisional IRA explosives expert, was spotted crossing the Spanish border into Gibraltar. An MI5 surveillance map survives of her precise route. Shows her going 
going into the Gibraltar Cathedral to light a candle, say a prayer. She believed in the justice of her cause. O'Hanlon was on her own surveillance mission. The IRA's target was the Royal Gibraltar Regiment's changing of the guard ceremony. MI5's files show that O'Hanlon watched the ceremony, then, excitedly, phoned Danny McCann, a known IRA hitman. Then, she headed back across the border. But when she's back in Spain, she spots Spanish surveillance, so she goes back to Ireland, and that saves her life. According to the files, Siobhan was replaced by Mairead Farrell. MI5's role was to coordinate intelligence, plan a response to the IRA team, and guide and advise the police as the operation unfolded. Events reached a climax on Sunday, March the 6th, 1988. At 2.25 that afternoon, Farrell and McCann were observed crossing La Linea checkpoint on foot by an MI5 surveillance team. A third terrorist, Sean Savage, drove across the border unnoticed. Later, the three met in a park. At around 3.40, an SAS team intercepted and shot all three dead. Did the soldiers give a warning? They didn't give them the, 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 the option of, of surrendering or, anything, or, or defending themselves. They just killed them, and I, I think that was not, that was not a good thing. I, I don't think it was right and proper. The MI5 files paint a picture of the SAS team facing a classic dilemma. They said they couldn't risk the parked car being a car bomb or the IRA team drawing weapons. But it turned out that the IRA team was unarmed and there was no bomb in their car. What you have to say is there were plenty of opportunities to arrest those IRA members before they got into Gibraltar. And since they were unarmed, could they have been taken without shooting, perhaps? And the final thing you've got to ask is, do you employ the SAS if you want people to be taken alive? I'm entirely satisfied from looking at files that this was not shoot to kill. If there had been any deliberate intention to shoot to kill, then press lines would have been uh, prepared to explain why it was that they'd been killed. One of the reasons for the confusion afterwards is that there was absolutely no government line on why these three people had been shot, which is why ministers contradict themselves uh, the following day. If there'd been a deliberate policy, the story would have been worked out in advance. I think that one of the problems that Christopher Andrew has got with this book is that he is a historian who tells the truth but he's writing the history of an institution, an organization that doesn't always tell the truth. In fact, most organizations don't. They have this thing called the institutional truth. It's not what happened, it's what the organization wants the rest of the world to think happened. Indeed, they may persuade themselves it happened, but it didn't. An inquest absolved the SAS of any wrongdoing. Later, the European Court of Human Rights ruled the killings unnecessary. MI5 felt damaged by the Gibraltar incident because if you are accused in a BAFTA-winning film of operating a shoot-to-kill policy, and many people uh, believe that, then you know, both your reputation and your morale is necessarily affected. Three years after the Gibraltar shootings, another IRA operation in the heart of the British government put MI5 in a central counter-terrorism role. In an audacious attack, the IRA fired mortars at 10 Downing Street, just as Prime Minister John Major was holding a cabinet meeting. Major said afterwards that he had been told that if the mortar, which was fired from a white van on Horsegarts Avenue, had got 10 foot closer, there would have been deaths in the cabinet room. And it was very close to being the biggest success in the entire history of Irish Republican terrorism. It was a turning point. Major was very, very annoyed. He reached the conclusion that it was time for the lead intelligence role against the IRA on the British mainland to be transferred to MI5 for the first time. Soon afterwards, it emerged that Major's government was involved in back-channel conversations with the IRA, contrary to official policy. The files in MI5's headquarters confirm that a number of its officers were instrumental in making these talks happen. 
we were intimately involved in, in, in these these discussions. They were really important, I think, because they started the process or they reinforced the process of the provisionals thinking about politics and thinking about the potential for political gains absent violence. This will be the image remembered in history. The Ulster Unionist and Sinn Féin leaders applauding the same thing. With Irish terrorists laying down their arms in favor of the ballot box and the Cold War over, MI5 was looking at an uncertain future in the late 1990s. Then a new adversary appeared, bigger than any that had gone before. When 9-11 shocked the world, Al-Qaeda was already on MI5's radar. But no one was prepared for suicide bombers using planes. The service was slow cottoning on to Al-Qaeda. So was the whole of Whitehall. So was the whole of the media. In fact, MI5 had already foiled an Al-Qaeda-inspired plot without fully realizing it. So far as we know, the first Islamist bomb factory almost established in Britain happened over a year before 9-11. Fortunately, the man who was seeking to establish it, who was somebody called Moinul Abedin, was under surveillance. He was caught in Operation Large. He was arrested. He is now spending a long time in prison. At that stage, we were rather thinking about foreign nationals coming into the country because that's what we'd hitherto seen. Aberdeen was of Bangladeshi origin, but a British citizen. The rules of engagement were changing, and a new threat was emerging. The events of 7-7 shocked MI5 and the police counterterrorism unit. They had not expected homegrown suicide bombers. It became clear within a day or two that what we were looking at was British suicide bombers, a completely new challenge for us and one of the biggest changes in terms of directing our response to counterterrorism. Now what we see is just simply a determination to kill as many people as possible. That seems to be the ambition of terrorists both here and overseas, and the casualty toll is immeasurably higher than it was from the Irish terrorist threat. The thing about the IRA is they always wanted to go home and have a Guinness. They weren't, uh, you know, martyrs. So you could, um, uh, you could sort of um, take some ranging shots as to what they might do, which were easier than current targets. If we can learn anything from history, it's that Al-Qaeda and those groups actually repeat their targeting, they repeat their attack methods. They've tried it before, they tried it in 2006, and I have no doubt at all that they will try it again. After 7-7 came criticism. Why hadn't MI5 identified and stopped the bombers? The Intelligence and Security Committee concluded that the number of potential terrorists was greater than the resources MI5 had to deal with the threat. Four years on, MI5 is being called to answer another allegation, complicity in torture. Binyam Mohamed Al-Habashi, an Ethiopian-born UK resident, claims he was tortured in Pakistan and Morocco and that his torturers received questions and materials from British intelligence. The allegations are still unproven, but if true, run contrary to an MI5 ethos established during the Second World War. German agents were interrogated at Camp 020 in Surrey, run by Colonel Robin Stevens, known as Tinai. He was called Tinai because he always wore a monocle. He had the manners and the appearance of a Prussian sergeant major, barked at the people who came in, told them they were reptiles, and he was going to treat them as reptiles unless they would work with him. He had one cast iron rule which he insisted on all his staff following. You must never actually touch a prisoner. Any sort of beating them up is absolutely out of the question. Quite right too, because if you once start beating a man up, he will tell you anything you like to get you to stop beating him up, doesn't mean that what he tells you is true. Tinai believed information gained under torture was not reliable. 
and that ethos seems as old as the service itself. And one of the questions, of course, that crops up from time to time is we want to get as much as we can out of captured agents. Should we torture them? And the answer is no, repeatedly in the MI5 files. Why do I believe these files? Well, because they were written, I know from some of the things that were written in them, uh, by people who had not the slightest idea that there was the slightest possibility that what they wrote would ever become known. MI5 files were not to become known at any point, full stop, ever. It is certainly the case that people who join the service are expected to have strong views about propriety. Generally speaking, you couldn't get them to do something naughty because they wouldn't do it. They'd say, no, no, that's not proper. And that's a good thing, it's healthy. And the staff's sort of own sense of what's right and wrong is a very strong part of the service's tradition. The final word lies with the police and the courts. But it might be one of those controversies that even the files cannot lay to rest. After six years studying its secrets, Christopher Andrew believes the files don't just have lessons for MI5. I think that the old saying that those who do not understand past mistakes are jolly likely to uh, repeat them happened in the case of MI5, as it happened in the case of British government time after time after time. After a hundred years, MI5 is proud of its history, but realistic about its future. Some of the things we've done have been first class and some of the things haven't been first class. You're not going to get all the judgments right. You're not going to get the intelligence you need on every case. So you expect not to win every war, as it were, or not to win every battle, just to win the wars.